Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As this one said, I'm Leonardo. And this is a joint work with Manuel Lopez e Bynes and Thomas Tutsu. They're my, they're my supervisors in ULB, Brussels. And the basic idea is that we're going to be talking about the automatic generation of multi objective algorithms for one specific problem called the B objective knapsack. And let me start with a little. OK, let's see if it works. OK, so um, let me start just saying who I am because. People were asking, so let me show you like a, just a brief idea. I come from Brazil, a city called Natal, and this is an image of my hometown. So this is the hotel I'm going to get married next month. So <laughs> uh, if you ever want to come and organize a conference, you're welcome. I will be the local committee, and I will be there for three months in advance so that I can help you do everything. And it's the World Cup next year, so it's really a good time for you to come. And now I'm in Brussels. I'm not going to show a picture of Brussels for obvious reasons. <laughs> and I have a, a BSc and an MSc in computer science from a university in Brazil, Federal University in my region. And now I'm a PhD student at Iridia. Iridia is a lab which we consider to be a little huge because it's like 35 people uh, divided in optimization and in robotics. Particularly, I'm in optimization. And uh, it's, uh, we are 35 people, 50 of them are Italian. So we are, it's kind of like an Italian lab inside Brussels. Uh, I'm in optimization, most specifically in multi-objective optimization. And my current research is focused on generalizing algorithm components that had been proposed originally only for B-objective optimization. Now I'm trying to make them uh, feasible for any number of objectives. And in Iridi specifically, I also started working with the automatic design of algorithms, which is the topic that I'm addressing here in this presentation. So let me go a bit on the motivation. Uh, first, it's multi-objective combinatorial optimization. So if you know a little about optimization, you know that single objective combinatorial optimization already has a lot of practical relevance for industrial purposes, although it's usually like a little complex area because the algorithms are not exactly polynomial because the runtime would explode and this kind of thing. So we also uh, deal with uh, approximate, approximative algorithms, heuristic algorithms. And in multi-objective optimization, you still have a better uh, description or modeling of the real world situations because now you have more than one criteria to be optimized. But the drawback is that even the problems that were still considered simple, simple for single objective optimization, like they were polynomial, now they're NP hard. So it's really you're going for metaheuristics or approximate algorithms all the time. And one of the fields that has been developing greatly is multi-objective and colony optimization. So let's, we have a large number of design proposals of or like 10 years of research. And this means that there's already a lot of things that have been developed, but that also means that designing a model algorithm becomes something like, okay, you have a lot of work to find the specific configuration that would suit best your problem. So what we're trying to do here is use automatic design. We're trying to reduce the effort from the human designer, and we're trying to make these become something simple that uh, you have to have knowledge about your problem for designing specific stuff, but many of the other things that you would have with to waste a little time, you will be doing it faster by using an automatic tool. So the thing is we showed high results for the B objective traveling salesman problem. Now we are testing in different problems that present different structures. The problem I cons I'm considering here is the B objective B dimensional knapsack problem. So let's go back a bit. This example I'm going to use is the knapsack, the original one that you know, uh, has a set of items and a knapsack. Here I'm considering a moving box because I'm considering my example when I was trying to move around from an apartment to the other in Brussels. And here for, for sure you had the same problem. So here you have a set of items that you want to put inside a knapsack, in this case a box, and I'm considering here that it's B objective. In the original knapsack problem, you had something like a, a profit function that you would evaluate your items and a capacity constraint, so you cannot put more items than the knapsack can fit, and you're trying to maximize a profit. Here we're considering two objectives, so let's say two profits. The first one is the value in euros, for sure, the MacBook is really expensive, the beer in Brussels is really cheap, but there's also the personal satisfaction. For example, I don't drink, but I really like PlayStation. I really like to play video games. So you're trying to maximize the personal satisfaction and also the value in euros because, yeah, you're not leaving a MacBook behind to take some chocolate. That's an easy choice. But still, the guy really likes chocolate. He can bring it to the family and he has his personal items. So the idea is in this knapsack, you have the first constraint, which is obviously the volume. If it cannot fit physically, it cannot be in there. 
But we are here considering the B-dimensional knapsack, so there's a layer of duct tape here. If you put more than 20 pounds, it will break open. So you can also, you also have to respect the total weight that you put inside this box. So this is our problem. We have to select a subset of items that maximize both the satisfaction and the value in euros and respect both the space and the weight limit of the box. So this is multi-objective optimization in its uh, uh, core sense. Uh, you have multiple and usually conflicting criteria to be optimized and when you're comparing solutions, let's say that this solution here is really good in terms of satisfaction but it's not so good in terms of the value in euros. And here you have the other opposite. You have uh, the value in euros is really good, the satisfaction not so much. Here we have kind of a trade-off. Uh, these three solutions, they cannot be said to be better one than the other because for each of the objective, one has better values than the other. So we say they are non-dominated. This is called Pareto dominance. It's a dominance relationship usually uh, used in multi objective optimization. And let's say that we had a solution like this well, this is worse than these for satisfaction and for value at the same time. So this is considered to be dominated. You don't need to consider this solution because this one is better for both objectives simultaneously. So a multi-objective optimizer heuristic is trying to find the set of non-dominated solutions among all feasible solutions in the problem. So we are talking now about end colony optimization. Uh, the basic idea behind this is if you put a nest of ants here and some food source here that they're trying to reach and you have two paths, one being shorter, the other being longer, in the beginning you have a similar distribution, an even distribution and they will try to go both ways. But what happens is that as the ants are traversing these paths, they're depositing pheromone. So what will happen is that these ones that are traveling shorter paths, they will come back faster and they will keep going here, so they're depositing pheromone more often, and this trail becomes stronger. So now when the other ants are trying to choose which path to take, they will go for the stronger trail. So this is what we're trying to do, and e eventually you will converge to here. This is not computer science, this is really biology, this is an experiment conducted by Denenberg, I think, and he shows that this actually happens. So the computational uh, met uh, inspiration uh, or maybe uh, the computational metaphor will be to mimic this as agents that will be searching in a, uh, uh, the search space. So the idea is we have a construct, uh, constructive metaheuristic that uses both heuristic information, which is already known about the problem, and also pheromone information, which is the information that you're learning during the running of the algorithm. And this is called swarm intelligence. You have a set of agents that are trying to, like, through stigmergy, to reach some kind of intelligence. So what we're going to do is that we're going to reinforce the pheromone for the solutions that are good. We are going to evaporate all the pheromone so that in the end we're going to have like, it's kind of like a neon, where you're going to have dark light and only those trails are going to be stronger than the others. And sometimes we are going to use pheromone bounds to say that they're never going to reach below that limit or higher than that limit. So this is basically end colony optimization. So when you're talking about multi-objective and colony optimization, you kind of enlarge the number of decision factors. So for example, you can have one pheromone structure for each of the objectives. That's one example of what you can have. You can also have, when you're updating pheromone, you, let's say that you have multiple colonies and not just one, you can choose different methods for updating. And also, uh, I'm going to explain this too, there are also others. And there's also the numerical parameters that are ready from the metaheuristic. So I'm going to try to see, to show you how large this scope is. And let me start with this objective specific pheromone structures, for example. Let's say we have one pheromone for each of the heuristics. Usually, end colony works like this. Let me try to break this equation down. You're trying to take a decision, so you're evaluating the probability of choosing that component. So what you do is that you get the pheromone information for that solution component and the heuristic information for that solution component, both are weighted according to these parameters, alpha and beta. And what you're doing is that you normalize against the rest of the other options. That's the only thing that you're doing here. So if you can choose it, you're going to use these probabilities and you're going to randomly choose one of the decision possibilities, one of the solution components. Now, when you're considering pheromone here, usually you're considering just one pheromone information. If you're using one for each objective, you have to aggregate them. So if you use either multiple pheromone or multiple heuristic information, you can aggregate using, for example, this is for pheromone. Uh, you could aggregate by using weighted sum or weighted product. 
uh, actually the opposite, a weighted product or weighted sum, which basically means that you're going to use like a parameter to say the importance of each of the objectives. So if you put 0.5 here, you'd have that both contribute equally. And by varying this value, you can actually vary the area of the objective space that you're actually searching. So let me show you here. When you have a multi-colony, for example, this is what you would have. Let's say that you have three colonies, one red, the other blue, the other green. Like the red ants would be searching around here, giving more importance to the first objective, uh, actually to the second objective. The green ones would be here more to the first objective. And here the blues would be trying to find more to the center, to the trade-off region. So let's say that you have ants that have found all these solutions during one iteration, and you're going to reinforce the pheromone. So there are two basic options. First, you can, for example, select them based on where they are, where they belong, the origin of the ants. So the red ones will go update the pheromone structure of the red colony. The blue ones will update the pheromone of the blue one and the green one of the green one. So that's what we call update by origin. But let's say that you want to update based on the region. So now you're not splitting based on where the solutions came from, but where they were actually found. So here you have solutions that were found by ants from the blue colony, but they're going to update the information in the red colony. So this is what we call uh, update by region. This is one of the strategies that is used when you're using multi-colony approaches. So there's a vast number of solution components that can be used. And what we have here is that we implement, uh, Manuel and Thomas implemented the Moaco framework that basically implements most of these solution compo uh, uh, algorithm components that are found in the literature. And the good thing is that when you have all of this implemented, you also have the possibility of combining the existing components in novel ways. So we started experimenting what could happen if you start doing things that haven't been done in the literature just by mixing components from different uh, proposals. So this is a small fraction of the table of all the components. I don't intend to explain it. I just want to highlight the number of existing possibilities. And these are the ones that I showed you. Like, Pheromone can be single or multiple, heuristic can be single or multiple, the aggregation methods, if it's going to update by origin or by region. So it's an extensive list of components that has been implemented. And this is why we say that it's not uh, worth it for a human designer to be testing everything because even becomes unfeasible. It even becomes unfeasible. So what we are going to do is that we're going to use automatic offline tuning, like you do for parameter, for parameter tuning. But here, we are going to be combining with a flexible framework. So we are not only tuning the algorithm, we are actually designing the algorithm. You're giving all the components as input, and the automatic tuner will give an output that is actually a design of an algorithm. So this was used for the B-objective TSP, and it got like state-of-the-art Moaco results. It was the best Moaco compared to all the other Moacos that had been implemented for the TSP. So let me show how the tool that we use, that is called iterated f -race, works. Uh, the idea is that you have a set of probabilities for each of the parameters, and in the beginning they are completely unbiased. So you generate a set of configurations, a set of candidates, using those parameters, and you're going to race them. You, instance by instance, you're going to compare them. You run and then you compare them based on uh, solution quality. And till you have statistical significance for what you want, here we use an F, so we call uh, uh, it's Friedman. So when you get to a certain point where you had enough statistical evidence for what you want, you start discarding the worst ones. You keep running this instance by instance until you get to the point where you have run out of your budget or you have a minimal number of surviving candidates. The budget can be either runtime or it can be number of experiments. So when you get to this point where you have a, 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 a reach at the end of a race, is since we're using the iterated F race, we're going to run again, but we're going to use this information to update the probabilities. So it's kind of like you're trying to move the algorithm towards the search space region, which appears to be more promising. So how do we do this? We try to evaluate the configurations. In single objective optimization, you would use solution quality. You run the algorithm with that configuration, you get one output, and that's the, 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 the value, the quality of that configuration. Here in multi-objective optimization, you have a set of non-dominated solutions. So what you're going to do is what we call quality indicators. So for example, we use here the hypervolume, which is really used in multi-objective optimization. Let's say you have these three solutions. This one is better than any solution in this subspace. So we say that it dominates this subspace. 
this one dominates the blue subspace and this one dominates the green subspace. So the hypervolume is the union of these areas. So the larger the hypervolume, the better the quality of the configuration. So that's how we are testing different configurations, different designs of our MOAC algorithms. So how do we test it? We compare against MOAC algorithms that have been proposed for this problem. That's how we are comparing automatic design against human design. Uh, there are four variants, and we use an extended version that I implemented of the framework to implement all these algorithms. So our setup works like this. We use these four instances, each uh, having this number of items, 100 to 50, 500 and 750 items. And we use two instance sets also for extending the number of instances that we're using. It's the same methodology for creation. And we have 120 instances and 200 testing instances there. These are for randomly chosen the, uh, in this interval, the number of items. And these are 50 of each size. The problem is that the original algorithm, the original paper that proposes those algorithms we are comparing to, it uses four different termination criteria. So each algorithm ran for a different runtime and number of evaluations. So what happened was that one of the algorithms had 100 times longer runtime than the others. So that's, what, uh, that's why it was considered to be the better. So here what we do is, OK, we run everything for all different time criteria. So every algorithm is being run for the four time criteria so that you can say, OK, it's kind of like we're taking snapshots and we're seeing how it's progressing. So uh, the agenda is we tune the numerical parameters from the original algorithms to say, OK, they had been tuned manually but there were like eight parameters. Let's see if automatically tuning them, we can still improve these algorithms. And then we're going to generate automoaco and compare to these tuned versions. So uh, this is a box plot con uh, containing the algorithms, the instances, and the hypervolume in this horizontal axis. So since we're looking for higher values of hypervolume, the rightmost values are the best ones. These are uh, uh, horizontal box plots. So here, for example, you have the instance from Zitzler that has 750 items. And in this column, you only have items with 750 items. And here, we set with 500 items. So Emaco 1 to 4 are listed here. And these are the tuned versions. So Emaco 1 tuned is always better than Emaco 1 for all of them. And this is always true. The tuned versions are always much better than the original ones. And the only thing we did here was actually tune the numerical parameters. We didn't change anything, we just tuned using automatic tuning. So this is showing that even with a limited number of parameters, since they are numerical, usually tuning them would take a while and we were able to improve them just by doing this. So let me show you a plot that is typical from B objective optimization, which is called an EAF different, difference plot. These represent the, the outputs based on distribution probabilities. So you're trying to, differ, to make a difference between the probability, uh, the distribution probability from here to here. These are two algorithms. This is a MACO2 tuned, and this is a MACO2. So you see that here, the fronts, that you, the, the sets that you find, they're much further from the origin. That's why when you make the difference, you see the dark area here. It's kind of like this is uh, uh, superposes over this. And when you make the difference, you have the result on this right side. So we are looking for the plots that show you the darker areas, because the darker the area, that means the bigger was the difference from that point. Well, in this point here, for example, this algorithm was able to always find one point that dominated it, and this was never able to find it. If you go for a little lighter area here, maybe the difference was like 20% or something like that. It's like 80% of the times this found, 20% this other found. So you see that the tuned version is much better than the original version, just because we tuned it. This is not about changing components. Now what we do is that we generate, uh, we, let, me see, let us see the rankings. We see that for all the four time uh, uh, criteria, you have that the tuned versions are better than the original versions. And also, it's always like this. Uh, uh, Mac 2 is the best. And if you're testing for statistical significance, we're using Friedman at 95% of statistical confidence. Uh, what we have here is that Emaco 2 tune will always be better, except for this one where it's kind of tied with Emaco 1. But we can be sure that we go for Emaco 2. Yes, please. Um, so what, uh, I might have missed this. What do you mean by tune? You change the parameter values? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say that you have a parameter alpha that goes for the importance of the pheromone information. So it was originally set to 0.6. Now we're tuning it. We're allowing it to take different values. 
Uh, and when we tune it, we find another value that is better, just and, by changing and the by, uh, So you calculate for the time, so it's kind of the, the goal function is something with time? It's no, we run until this time limit, uh, and the output, the goal function is the solution quality that is written. I mean, the output, uh, the hyper volume of the output. That's so how it, Do you always have the same goal function then? Yeah, it's always the output of non-dominated solutions, considering the hyper volume. So it's always the, 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 the hyper volume of the sets. Considering the same origin of the axis, so you're considering the same reference point. So you're always trying to maximize the hyper volume. It's the same for everything. Understood? Mm. Okay, maybe, okay. Later maybe I can explain it better. So what happens here is that the tuned version is always better than the original ones just because we tuned numerical parameters. Now we go for designing actually a new algorithm automatically. That's what we call automoaco. So the iris chose a multi-colony algorithm that uses multiple pheromone structures with weighted product aggregation, multiple heuristic information, so one for each objective, and weighted sum aggregation. And also uh, it uses, uh, it's considered to be a very greedy algorithm because it really depends on the heuristic information. Now we see the difference here between Automoaco and the best one that was Emaco 2 tuned. And you see that over the whole extension of the objective space, you see that you have an improvement. So one thing that we analyze here, is this is for 500 items, but it's an average uh, result for all the others. So one thing that we analyzed here was that we were also given the option of choosing a different heuristic. So we, one of the components that we allowed the, uh, the, the automatic to, to choose was a different heuristic, and actually that heuristic was chosen. So we wanted to eliminate the possibility that the better results were due only to the heuristic change. So what we do is that we tune the original algorithms, allowing also that heuristic to be chosen. And you see that, yeah, the heuristic had a big effect. So you see here the difference. It's improved a lot over the originals just because we now have the different heuristic. So this is retuned, now allowing also a different heuristic. Now we compare this version against the automaco that we generated. You see the improvement is now smaller, but there's still improvement throughout the whole space. Even here when you have place, uh, uh, areas where there were gaps, automaco usually performs well because this dashed line here is the medium performance. And you see that the medium here is closer to the gaps. Here the medium you cannot even see because it's closer to the maximum, to the best one. So let's see a box plot of the comparison like of the winners. So you have Emaco 2, which was the original best, Emaco 2 tuned, Emaco 2 tuned allowing a different heuristic, and then Automaco. And you see that for the four Zitzler instances, and I have the box plot for more instances and, and the, the paper if you want to see them, uh, you see that the Automaco also has better values, even if here for 100 and 250, which are small instances, the performance is a little close, here when you increase the size of the, of the instances, you have a big distance. See, remember that these values are normalized, so even if you don't see a big distance here, there's still a probability that there is just because this is too bad, so it's making the, the interval a little stretched. So. Uh, this is what we were able to show with our work. So if you see a table with the rankings, it's always like this. Automo this is a lot of information, let me just give a, an overview. So Automago is always better than the tuned with heuristic, which by their turn are better than the tuned without changing heuristic, which by their turn are better than the original one. So we were able to show that automatic tuning is good, but even better is to use automatic design because here you're having a better algorithm. So we are confirming the robustness of the methodology because now it's the second problem for which we show that it works. Actually, not only the second, but for Moaco specifically, it's the second. Uh, it's, it became really greedy, so it was really flexible in the sense that ACO usually is more based on pheromone than on heuristics, but in this case, the heuristic was really important. And it was interesting because we were able to choose a better heuristic just because uh, the automatic design allowed us to do it. And as future work, we, were, we have been working on other multi-objective problems, on other meta heuristics, and other uh, higher number of objectives. So this is basically what I had to show you. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, and if I can try to solve that other question.
I don't exactly know how it, this relates to your work, so please bridge. I know some people work on uh, optimization, especially Lara. Yeah. yeah, they have some questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, so first, I wanted to ask you how long does it actually take to tune the parameters, just to tune parameters, not to choose the first. Oh, it depends on the, the, the budget that you're setting and what is the processing power that you have. In my case, we have a cluster and the run times are not long. So nothing would take uh, over one day, but one day is like for a really long uh, time setting. Usually I would tune things in maybe four hours, five hours, but that also depends on the processing power that you have. And the problem like this one is was working with something that takes days. So for him, tuning prop for sure would take a little more, but then you can set the time limit as the budget. So you could say, okay, I will give you like one day or one week or the time that is interesting for you, and then it will run only for that time limit. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, it's not you tune the, uh, the algorithm for a specific problem. So you tailor the algorithm for the problem. You don't have to do it each time you optimize. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is clear. Yeah. You do it once just to generate the algorithm, and then that's yeah, it. Sure. And even here, we are using time-specific uh, uh, settings, but we also research, and there are some good works on that field of any time behavior. So the idea is that you would not tune for a specific time limit, but let, let's say for a time interval. So you would be sure that around that time interval, this is the best configuration that you could have, even if it's not the best one for one specific time uh, limit. Yeah. So that's also a possibility, depends on your application. Thank you. Okay, you ask. Uh, I was interested how you, I mean, so this is, um, you have multi objectives, so your goal function is, um, let's say, could be multi dimensional. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you, you said you, you have two options to combining those different uh, dimensions, either multiplication or, or adding up, but I mean, uh, yeah. There are several Even there ways. are there, there are a lot of more ways options. Yeah, there are several ways to do it. Why do you? I mean, no, what's the real goal? I mean, you don't really know. So whatever way you t you choose your uh, optimization function, you would get a different result. No, I but uh, uh, consider that. Let me go back to that slide. Consider that I'm not doing it for the whole problem. When I tell you that I have different colonies, it's kind of like every colony is considering a different aggregation. So you're searching over the whole space. You can do it differently, like uh, linearly, or there are some uh, functions and mm -hmm. utility functions and all sorts of ways of combining so that you can make the problem easier. But still, you're trying to search over the whole space. Uh, okay. You don't stick to like one configuration. It's not one just a Actually, if you have an application that demands one specific aggregation, you go for it, and then you go back to single objective. It's actually much mm -hmm. easier. But usually you do here because you're considering that the output will be subject to, like, say, a decision maker, and then that decision maker will choose for that specific situation what's best for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you already have a set of output solutions, you could come back to the same set of solutions even if your preferences change. Mm -hmm. So you only need to run it once, for example. So. Uh, you had more questions? Yeah, yeah, I had okay. another one. You mentioned that in the, in the future work that you want to consider some other heuristics as well. Yeah. Which kind of heuristics? I did it already. With, okay, in the lab we have done it with uh, also for multi object optimization because that's what we work most uh, for local search, like Pareto local search, phase local search, and something like that. Uh, I was recently presenting in EvoStar an analysis of local search, but I also did an automatic analysis. And I didn't show it because the results were uh, not so improving regarding what we already had in the beginning. So the I had done like the full experimental analysis. It, once you have done it, the automatic uh, uh, tuning doesn't make much sense because now you already know where you should go. So the automatic tuning would re return the same thing that I found mm -hmm. through the experimental analysis. So and also it was it has been done for single objective local search with uh, iterated local search, iterated greedy. It had, I think it was just published this year now uh, uh, on single objective local search. Uh, and there are also other metaheuristics that we're considering. And there's also other problems. So this was for the NAPSEC, but they already did it for Flowshop and TSP and some other problems because we always try to tackle like major problems so that it's easier to have an impact in the, yeah. to make the work easily, easily known. 
So here it's the map side because everybody uses the map side for mode objective optimization. So it's easy to compare to have a, a frame of reference, for example. Um, um, uh, I'm a little bit confused about uh, the broadness of, of, the, of the algorithms you use or uh, try on with this with you. Um, so you say, are you saying that you have found a tuning for all possible multi-objective knapsack problems? Or are you varying certain parts. So, so what is really the problem and what are the instances? So you're designing an algorithm and you're tuning up some parameters. Okay, okay. so and yeah. the question is what is the scope now of or what is the claim that you're solving better? Yeah? Okay. Which 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 problem? So so the claim usually in optimization is like this. You try to choose a problem. If if it's not problem specific it's even better. And this is not problem specific. You can apply to any problem. So let's say that you choose one problem like the knapsack or like the TSP or like the flow shop. You just implement the modules that are specific for the problem in the framework, but you have uh, many components that are just from metaheuristics. And metaheuristics are generally proposed for any problems. You just adapt them. You just make like the specific like solution representation and solution modification, this kind of stuff, which is problem dependent. Now, since you have a framework of a metaheuristic, and you have several components there, what I'm telling you is that if you implement these for any given problem and you just use the methodology that we're proposing, which is using an automatic design, you can design an algorithm for your problem that you will know will be a good algorithm because it's testing different uh, designs from end colony and it's giving you a design that for sure is good, even if it's not the better because the best one because this is not exhaustive, this is also heuristic and it's giving you a good design that can be used let's say that you have an instance generator for your problem or you have real world scenarios and you want to design for that specific context you just use that as an input and then you get an output as a that's a, a mock algorithm it's an algorithm for that problem and let's say that you have different runtimes and different stopping criteria you can do as i said anytime uh, a behavior way of doing it and then it will be uh, usable for different let me phrase it differently. Okay. Are you claiming that you have not found an heuristic for all MP complete problems? No, no. What we have is different. Exactly. So the question is what are the boundaries? Uh, especially in your tests. So I assume you have a, a set of problem instances. Yeah. Okay. And then you're tuning your algorithm. Uh -huh. Okay? And then the hope is that all the new instances are seen. Yeah? can be solved better than other existing algorithms do. Right? Because usually what... So, and there, there it makes a difference if you say I have an abstract problem where I have, for example, just varying... I, I, basically, I have a parametrized problem. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, I just changing the, 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 the instances in, in a, I, I have not all possible instances of, of two-dimensional yeah. uh, knapsack problems, but I'm focusing to a special distribution of input instances, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah? Because but otherwise okay. you're claiming that no, no, but, but you have you're, you're a heuristic for all of yeah, but, but there are the problems. But there are two things there that have to be considered. First, usually you don't, you're not able to deal with all kinds of, let's say, knapsack. You cannot deal with all kinds of instances. You try to make like a, like a, a random or at least a number of different structured instances and you're trying to fight instance generator so that to say if it comes from that instance generator probably you already tackle that. But on the other hand, since this methodology is automatic, if you bring new instances, you can just run it again and maybe even if you get a different algorithm, you still have the same methodology. And if you have different instances or if a different problem, you just run the methodology again, it's the same. This is actually the field of hyper-heuristics in that sense, because you're not worrying so much about the problem, you're worrying about how to develop heuristics for the problem in an automatic way. So it's not that you solve them, but this is applicable to any NP-complete problem, as long as you can model them in a way that makes sense. And for example, our, uh, and colony is constructive. So for some problems, constructive heuristics do not make sense. For those, you should probably use different metaheuristics. But for these kind of problems, like vehicle routing and shortest paths and all TSP and all these kind of problems, this is very straightforward. So yeah, we expect it to have good results. 
But the methodology behind it, the automatic design, can also be applied to other metaheuristics. So in a general sense, we're saying that you can always, always climb up a little bit mm -hmm. and go down to a different direction. But so how, how have you generated the instances in your case? In this your case, case, I'm using the methodology that's common in this problems literature, which is you generate, uh, let me get just the, yeah. So you generate 100 items, for example, and then you're selecting the, the, the weights and the profits being random in a certain interval. And then you set the capacity to be half of the sum of the weights so that you're expecting half of the items to be there. Regarding the knapsack specifically, I know there are some other ways to do generate instances that would be harder, but this is what's kind of like benchmark. We wanted to stick to the benchmark so that we could compare to other algorithms. Uh, and as I said in the video, we are not exactly focusing on the problem much, much, but more in the methodologies. Mm -hmm. So and the idea is that you could apply this to the other instances or to other problems also. Have you an idea of how far off you are from the optimum? Yeah, that's really impossible. Okay, okay, no, it's not impossible. Because actually, uh, an, uh, an exact algorithm was run for these instances, and the basic idea is that we get to the optimal, but, uh, for example, when the larger instances uh, are considered, what we are having here is that we may have gaps for one of the objectives because the heuristics are not so good for that objective, and also the number of solutions, there are many solutions that we don't find. So I have the, 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 the actually, the, it's called the Pareto uh, sets, and I have them, but when you compare to them, it's kind of like you get like, one gets like say 95%, 99%, 99.9, 5 The complicated thing is assessing how important that gap is, because that depends on the practical applications and that you can actually say, okay, this is, enough or not. Mm. Which type of local search techniques have you experienced? In this case, none. In no, the other mean? one, I was using uh, removing one item, removing our items and inserting as many as possible, which is basically what is used. And what I showed was that uh, it's better if you just remove one item at a time and you consider narrow candidate lists, uh, uh, both for insertion and also for removal. So uh, I, I also have that work in the paper, I can send you the link. I was presenting in Evostar last week. But that was, I prefer to present here the, this because I thought it was a little bit closer to what uh, evolutionary algorithms that some people here use. So I thought it was closer. So this is the first stage of the work. The second stage was like analyzing and then going for local search. Yeah, that's the problem because, uh, as I told you, uh, we are more interested in theoretical. Okay, I'm not going to include myself in that. The lab is more interested in theoretical uh, approaches, which has the good thing, the, the advantage of being reproducible to any setting. But uh, no, specifically with real world situations, no, because uh, we were trying to use the benchmark that was used commonly. So. The idea is that if you prove that it works with random instances, you would be getting, uh, you're not biasing toward a specific structure of the instance, of the problem. So, but yes, real world, uh, if you want to test it for real world situations and please provide feedback, that would be really, really good. Have you ever tried to combine this with um, some complete methods? Uh, for example, Using, using the heuristic to make decisions for sub solvers, for example, or for construction. Yeah. Well, usually that's that's really common when you have a problem that in the single objective version it's polynomial. So before coming to the idea, I was working shortest path, for example, the multi objective version. So usually what you try to do is that you try to use exact algorithms in the beginning to generate what we call supported solutions, which are the solutions that you can just combine, aggregate the, 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 the solution, the objective functions, and then for sure you get to solution that is efficient, it's not dominated. So usually you do that as a first step, and then from that you proceed with the metaheuristic to try to find the other solutions. So here I haven't done it because uh, I was trying to use the same way that it's used in the literature, but uh, I've done it 
not me, a colleague has done it with local search, which is called, we call it two-phase local search. So the first phase you're using just methods that are exact, mm -hmm. and then in the second phase you're using metaheuristics to see if you can uh, find the other solutions that you haven't been able to find. If you have, please. I was in Evocop last week, there were no questions, so. And just one more. There is room. There were a couple of words, multi, in this whole uh, system, like multi colony and multi object. Do you know the maximum value, the maximum number you can still compute? Yeah, uh, truth be told, it's not, okay, it doesn't depend on the metaheuristic. It depends on the dominance relation that you use. Mm -hmm. Because Pareto dominance, really gets weak when you're considering three. Three is still, it's visible. But from four on, almost all the solutions, like a bigger, a larger number of solutions, will be considered to be non-dominated. But that in practice is really unfeasible because you don't want to give like 10,000 non-dominated solutions to a decision maker for him to choose. He will never do it. So usually what we do is that we keep, like the solutions are kept in archives, which are like restricted. You can like uh, discriminate ways to keep it div diversified along the objective space and still within a reasonable bound. So let's say even a thousand solutions would be a lot. But let's say that you generate a thousand solutions and then you have interactive ways of navigating through those solutions so that a decision maker could actually go for uh, one solution that is interesting for him or at least one region. So I was in Nemo, for example, two years ago and one of the applications was just that just getting the solutions, showing to the decision maker and how he can navigate to say, okay, for us, this region is better because this represents this. So among these solutions, among this region, this region, we have these solutions. Yeah, yeah, so among these 10 solutions, I choose this one. And there are several ways to do it because let's say you have 10 solutions, you can compare two at a time and then you use the votings for rankings and this kind of stuff. This is also a very specific research field in multi objective optimization. So, that, so the problem is not the number of objectives, is how you compare solutions because you don't want to give all of the solutions away as possible solutions. Any more questions? If not, then thank you very much for the talk.